just seems like we drift from that a little bit. And that's too yeah. bad. It gets too complicated. Yeah. It is too bad. And then it kind of opens the door to attacks on science, and science gets dismissed, right. which we're seeing in the political arena right now. But mm-hmm. yeah, science is cool. It it's is messy. Cool. You can make mistakes. I mean, you're supposed to make mistakes, right? You're supposed to disprove your hypothesis. Right. Where else are you told to go make some mistakes? Hello and welcome to A New Angle. I'm your host, Justin Angle, Associate Professor of Marketing at the University of Montana College of Business. This podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around Missoula, Montana. We're interested in creativity and hustle, and the people we'll speak with here exude both of those in spades. Buckle up and let's go. Hello and welcome back to A New Angle. Thanks for tuning in today. Today's episode was a fun one. I got the chance to sit down with Karen Knutson. Karen is the executive director of the Clark Fork Coalition, a nonprofit organization here in Missoula, Montana, dedicated to the restoration and preservation of the Clark Fork River. Clark Fork Coalition just celebrated a 10-year anniversary of the removal of the Milltown Dam. That's sort of their signature achievement and they continue to do great work on behalf of the Clark Fork Watershed. Full disclosure, I sit on the board of directors for the Clark Fork Coalition. It's a wonderful organization, and I really respect Karen's leadership of that organization. We talk a lot today about the mission and the values of the organization. The organization just went through a a strategic planning process to guide it for the next five years, and uh, it was just a fun conversation. I want to highlight, too, that the Clark Fork Coalition has an important event coming up this Saturday, April 21st. It's the annual river cleanup. It's going to go from 10 to noon at the, uh, you can meet at Karis Park. People are going to start meeting at 930. Following the river cleanup, there's a great barbecue. You can get some free food and just a big festive atmosphere to celebrate this very important river. So uh, check it out. And uh, before we get into today's episode, I also want to announce the winners of our giveaway contest. So if you recall, if you rated, reviewed, and shared the show um, in the last couple of weeks, we entered your name into a drawing uh, for a growler, a dram shop growler, or a gift card to the dram shop. So the the winners are, I only know the user IDs. So if the, you are one of these user IDs, you got to email me uh, at a new angle at umontana.edu. So the two winners are MT0406MSO. That's winner number one, wins the growler. And then Brad Run MT wins the gift card. So the two of you, if you're out there, uh, give us a holler so we can get you your prizes. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I'll turn you over to Karen Knutson. All right, we are here with Karen Knutson. Very excited to have you on the podcast, Karen. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Justin. My pleasure. I say thanks for coming. It feels a little bit silly. You're not in my <laughs> office. I'm actually at the Clark Fork Coalition. You're on my turf. That's right. I am <laughs> on your turf. You've been at this organization 22 years. Is that right? Actually, 23. 23. I'm closing okay. out 23, wow. heading into 24. Crazy, huh? Amazing. Yeah. So we'll get into that history, but first, you know, this is a business school podcast. Why on earth are we talking to a nonprofit organization? Well, we'll get into this in a lot of detail, but this is an organization that is laser focused on its mission and operationalizes that mission in a very inspiring way. And I'm excited to to kind of get into those details of how that gets done with Karen. But Karen, could you tell us just a little bit about the Clerk Fork Coalition, uh, its work, its size, its scope, mm-hmm. some of the history? Sure. To start with the basics, the Clark Fork Coalition is a member-supported nonprofit. Our mission is to protect and restore the Clark Fork watershed, and we do that through science-driven advocacy, on-the-ground stream restoration, and community education and outreach. So those are the three legs to the execution stool. Okay. Um, the Clark Fork watershed itself is a big sandbox. Mm-hmm. It's 14 million acres. The river, the Clark Fork River, starts in Butte at the headwaters on the Continental Divide, and then it flows east for 320 miles, picking up tributaries, some pretty beefy ones like Mm -hmm. the Blackfoot and the Bitterroot. Yeah, right here in town. Gets a huge slug of water from the Flathead and then makes its way to Lake Pondere in Idaho. Okay. And actually from there, 
even though it leaves our watershed at that point. From there, it forms Lake, po- or excuse me, the Ponderé River, and then it flows north into the Columbia River, right. and then on to the sea. So we're actually, the Clark Fork River system is actually the um, eastern headwaters of the entire Columbia River system, mm. and it provides more water by volume than any other of the Columbia River's tributaries. So it's a special place. Yeah, and I've heard the statistic 22,000 river miles in the watershed. Is that is that right? Actually, it's 22,000 square miles. Square, square miles, so that okay. refers to the land. But as far as the river miles, the main stem is 320 miles, mm-hmm. and then there's um, 122,000 stream miles all feeding into the main stem. So when you actually look at some hydrological graph of the Clark Fork watershed, there's just all these tiny little blue ribbons, yeah. all these little ribbons of life feeding into the Clark Fork River system. Okay. And as you said, 23 years, what was your point of entry? How did this organization <laughs> excite you and, and sort of attract you to pursue your life's work here? Yeah. Well, I actually was living in Portland, Oregon, right after graduate school okay. when I first heard about the Clark Fork Coalition. And um, I ended up in Portland, um, again, after graduate school in Syracuse, New York. Mm-hmm. To give a little more context to that move, I um, had previously been ski bumming in Colorado. Okay. And then decided it was time to get on with my life, make a positive contribution, Don't leave the hedonistic 20s behind. But yeah... I, Best times of my life in some ways. So I buckled down and went to graduate school. Okay. What little, did you study? I studied public administration. Okay. So I got a master's in public administration with a specific eye towards nonprofit management. Mm-hmm. But back in the 90s, there was, really was no graduate degree in nonprofit management. Okay. There is now, which yep. is awesome. So for me, the path was public administration. I was a little traumatized by having spent a couple of years in a northeast industrial town in New York, mm-hmm. so I decided I'm going to Alaska. So I was planning to go to Fairbanks, where I had some good friends living, doing work in the government sector, and okay. it sounded like there were some excellent opportunities and access to wild nature, mm-hmm. howling wilderness, um, and nature at its most multitudinous. So I thought, yeah. here I come, Alaska. I stopped <laughs> in Portland to visit a friend and loved it. I think it was maybe the only two weeks of the entire year where the sun was out. It was glorious. Oh my goodness, I couldn't believe mountains, access to oceans. So I looked for a job and got a job um, in a forestry, environmental forestry consulting firm. So the last trip was off the table. Off the table. Yeah. I did eventually go, but off the table. Sure. Um, So I was actually tasked, one of my jobs being a research associate was also to provide content for a magazine. And so we became aware of this group, the Clarkport Coalition, which Uh just seemed edgy and ambitious and doing some pretty cool things that seemed completely aspirational for Mm -hmm. uh, an organization that was all of four or five people. So I'd heard of them and written about them and even interviewed the executive director and then I, um, at a conference, met my husband, and he lived in Missoula, and we decided that uh, after a year of dating that we ne- needed to figure out who was going where, and I happily volunteered to come to Missoula, Montana, sure. yeah, yeah, because as my husband said when he was courting me, it's the center of the universe. It he is wasn't joking. Ways, yeah. It's the center of the universe. So I moved out here, and it just so happened that the Clark Fork Coalition had a job opening as a business manager. Okay. And I thought, well, I've never had any experience with business management, but I've certainly taken accounting. I've taken economics, statistics, organization theory. I thought I can do this. So I applied and got the job. Nice. And as a result, have worn many different hats at the organization over the last two plus decades Mm -hmm. from business management. Then I went into communications and education outreach. Started running some programs in River Smart Growth, uh, and eventually became executive director. Yeah. So that was my odyssey. Fantastic! And how many years have you now been executive director? Uh, ten. Ten. Tenth anniversary. Wonderful. I'm keeping that kind of under the radar. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll keep that under uh, password protection here on oh, the good. podcast. <laughs> so, uh, just by way of sort of full transparency to cl- disclosure. I am a relatively new board member of the Clark Fork Coalition, so um, getting a sort of drinking from the fire hose uh, impression of all the wonderful work you folks do. And we're sitting in, in, in the Clark Fork Coalition conference room a few days after um, 
a recent strategic planning retreat. Um, and this is a process the group goes through every five years. Is that right? Correct. Every five years. Okay. Okay. And it was, it was fantastic. We'll get into kind of some of that work uh, in our discussion today. But y- you talked about this right at the beginning of describing what the CFC does and that the protect and restore, those are, those are the two sort of key words in the mm-hmm. mission statement. And, you know, how, how does that, does that mission get revived every five years? Do you start with an, uh, you know, do you, do you tinker with that mission or is that the same mission that's been guiding the organization throughout its history? That has just been bedrock to us, that mission okay. statement. Mm-hmm. There maybe was a little tinkering around the fringes back in the 1990s when I think the mission was actually to protect and restore the Clark Fork River uh-huh. because we realized that suggested we were singly, singularly, singularly fixated right. on the Mainstem River. Mm-hmm. And as we know, a healthy river system really does require attention in a number of different areas, tributaries, feeder creeks, and streams. So we tinkered with that wording just ever yep. so slightly and changed the mission from to protect and restore the Clark Fork River to protect and restore the Clark Fork Watershed. Sure. But that has been the mission um, since the get-go. So that is... Uh, you know, that's in the lockbox. That's who we are. That's yeah, what we do. Absolutely. And so that being central, how do those two, as an organization, how do those two concepts work together, protection and restoration? Well, first, how do we define those? Right. And do those definitions change as facts on the ground change or just sort of how, how mm-hmm. those two terms that, that drive the mission lived in the organization? Yeah. Well, just to illuminate the mission even more, I mean, the way we think about it, Um, beyond just those two verbs, protect and restore. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. basically trying to um, protect the clean water and river life that is here in our hardworking watershed and restore what should be here but is not. Right. And um, probably, Justin, you're aware of the fact that that, um, the Clark Fork watershed has a pretty intense history of mining and smelting Right. Um, over the last 150 or so years um, in the headwaters. And something as huge as the Butte and Anaconda copper mining also required other industries that were pretty hard on river systems, mm-hmm. I mean, industrial scale, logging, grazing. I mean, all kinds of industries and several different different tributaries were pressed into service for this unbelievable mining boom that lasted into the 1970s, early 80s. Right. Um, so as a result, that's why we've got a lot of work to do with the restoration piece. That said, we still have some incredible clean water strongholds and pristine areas that are still intact and in performing um, their ecological services and adding value to communities. So we really want to be attentive to making sure that those, those areas are protected for the long haul. Um, then, of course, when some of our restoration projects come online and get completed, we want to make sure that we can protect those as well. Right, lock those in. And so what that has us, yeah, lock them in. So that means, I mean, we end up tracking what happens in the state legislature quite a bit, working with local governments and county commissioners on land use policies, just to make sure there's just no backsliding and that the needs of the river and the people who use the river and the wildlife that rely on the river are protected. Sure. And so when you're sort of thinking of the balance between protect and restore and then how you sort of manage your organization and its resources, how does how does this mission flow through into kind of an organizational structure at mm-hmm. the CFC? Yeah. Well, interestingly, um, the one thing that the way that we've structured the organization is there is quite a bit of flexibility and fluidity in a few programs. Okay. Um, and that is our protect, which is mostly advocacy and some of our education outreach. And that is by design Mm -hmm. because we've defined specifically what kinds of restoration outcomes we want to see over the next few years. For example, um, between 2018 and 2022, I think, the board, you, Justin, will be approving a strategic plan that really mm-hmm. has us focused on three headwater subbasins, the Upper Clark Fork, the Bitter, and the Blackhead, or excuse me, Blackfoot, looking specifically at increasing stream flows, improving feeder creeks and streams connections, 
improving um, functionality, making sure fish can move wherever they need to move, and make sure that communities are interacting responsibly with those rivers. So those are kind of going to be the core pillars, but then when it comes to protect and protecting and educating, we're going to take um, opportunities as they come along um, while making sure that we're just tracking the horizon, um, the landscape, to see if there's new threats where we really need to mobilize resources. An example with our protect slash advocacy work is this past year with the Trump administration, we saw um, a real attack on some environmental rules and policies that we had not seen before. So we really mobilized as an organization working with other partners to try and protect some of those policies. We did the same thing in the state legislature. Sure. So um, that's that's a program that really can respond quickly and in a nimble way to new threats and opportunities. And just being, you know, talking about this, being able to be nimble, as you say, and, and from a prioritizing standpoint, like you just have so much going on here. Was the staff about is 14? 14, 14. yeah. And, you know, anywhere from you know, Andrews, the, the staff attorney, to Lily, who's running these educational programs, to Jed, who's up in the rivers doing the restoration work. How do you sort of, how do you define the scope of what the, first of all, like from a high level, how do you define the scope of protect and restore could mean a lot of things. Mm -hmm. What are the sort of core functions that we do and, and what are the core functions we don't do? Right. That's a really good question. And it's something that we grapple with all the time. I mean, even on a daily basis mm -hmm. as a staff. Um, I think one of the things that has really helped us is asking ourselves the question, what does the watershed need most? Okay. Um, aside from a five-year strategic plan, we also engage in annual action planning and we review where we are, where our benchmarks are every quarter. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a chance to kind of hit the pause button with great regularity and make sure we're on target and make sure we're addressing the needs of the watershed. And so once you ask, what does the watershed need from us? How can the Clark Fork Coalition respond? It just does give us um, a pretty clear laser-like focus on the key objectives, high-level objectives, and the big wins that will help us move the needle in a big way. Sure. So we end up saying no a lot more than I like to do, but this is a huge watershed. It's a gigantic mission. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, so we really have to balance where we can be just really strategic and make a big difference and how we can also work with partners and leverage resources. Yeah, you know, I hear that more and more from successful leaders of org organizations that the job is more about saying no to things than it is <laughs> saying yes to things. And I don't mean to negatively yeah. frame that, but yeah. uh, you know, sort of staying within seems to be a really important concept yeah. in leadership. It's really important. Otherwise, you can just end up you know, spending resources and creative yeah. input on a lot of things that don't really deliver mm -hmm. because it's not core. It's funny with students uh, and just in, 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 in my work in general, it is very, the doing stuff and the spinning the wheels, that's the easy stuff to do. Like you can get sort of into that minutia and, and, and grind on projects mm -hmm. without this sort of higher level sense of awareness of well, what actually is this serving and is this work thoughtfully done and right and so yeah having that clarity and, yeah. and it seems like you know in my limited time here that that you guys just have a really good sense of staying true to that mission yeah we definitely try but i will add in also that another area that we're becoming a little more sensitive to or realizing is just as important is really understanding the root causes. I mean, mm. with conservation work, it changes rapidly um, and it's very complex. And I know that you heard in our strategic planning retreat that we've had a couple of setbacks. We haven't seen progress moving anywhere nearly as rapidly as we'd like to see on removal of contamination in the Upper Clark Fork and yep. at Smurfit Stone. So these types of retreats are great for us to just try and understand why that is. So I think, I mean, that's what I've been taking home the last couple of years, um, um, the importance of really getting at what are the forces at play here? Why are those forces being perpetuated? What are the root causes? And what's within our wheelhouse that um, we can deploy to shift some of those, sure. those issues? 
Yeah, and along those lines, a, a moment or two ago, you mentioned this notion of you know, it, it's nice to be able to pause yeah. and reflect and say, you know, or, I can't remember the phrasing of your question, what the river needs, mm-hmm. um, asking that question. Can you, can you walk us through maybe a, a scenario from your tenure here where you realize that, oh, yeah, we, we've drifted a little bit. Like, this is not what the river needs, and we got to shut mm-hmm. that down and take that effort or resources or whatever and put it elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Ha, ha, has that scenario, has that happened? Oh, sure. Yeah, probably more often than I care to think about. <laughs> but um, <laughs> one of the big ones that springs to mind is we got really involved for a while in some state-level policy. Um, we were thinking... This was during the 1990s and the early 2000s before Mm -hmm. the Great Recession. There was just a tremendous amount of growth. Building was booming, particularly in the Bitterroot, and a lot of the structures were just too close to the river. Okay. Rivers are more than just the water between the banks. It's riparian vegetation and floodplains. It's really valley wall to valley wall, and there's... um, appropriate places to build and not appropriate places to build and it didn't really seem like our policy frameworks were in place to um, support or encourage river smart growth. Right, when you're saying policy so, frameworks, you're talking about the muni- municipalities, the state government, county, like what are the different yeah, layers to that? Yeah, municipalities, counties, state. Um, I mean, I guess at the bottom, I mean, at the, bo- at the end of the day, it's really about human behaviors. Okay. And so we, for some reason, decided that the regulatory um, solution was the way to go. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we necessarily thought strategically or deeply enough about are there some other possibilities with influence influencing human behavior? Is there education we could be doing? Is there right. Are there some incentives, some voluntary incentives in the marketplace that we could be doing? We just jumped right into policy level work and decided that the state was the best way to go. We okay. really had not had much experience doing any kind of state level policy, but talked to some other conservation partners they were in. Okay. So we kind of led the way and charged into what was called um, setbacks regulations, mm-hmm. which ended up creating a firestorm of controversy, a lot of pushback from um, citizens and legislators in a State, as you know, Justin, having lived here now for how a year and a half, two Me? years, yeah, six half. years. Oh, you've been here six years. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you've been here that long. No, it's okay. Um, I'm not very noticeable. <laughs> no, you'll get there because you're on the board of the Clark Fork. That's right. Now. I'm trying. <laughs> um, but yeah, people, you know, they're a little bit more libertarian and don't like to be told what to do. Absolutely, particularly so, from folks from Missoula. Yeah, you know, that's uh. So I guess that kind of, so I, I guess anyway, the punchline is you kind of, it blew up and you realized that this yeah. maybe isn't the best way to solve this problem, yeah. not what the river needs. But I will say, I mean, you asked me about mission drift and I, I mean, it's not really mission drift. It's just recognizing that maybe this isn't the wheelhouse and that's not the solution. And we needed to be a little more thoughtful about all right. of those pieces. Um, this actually reminds me of something else though, that you, I mean, when you talk about something that seemed mission drifty and maybe you needed to get back on course, um, we decided to just jump into climate change research Mm. and try to um, shift or spark conversation in our community on climate change. Um, And we realized after we did a study and issued a report that people were suddenly looking to us to get involved in renewable energy and um, other solutions that could really tackle um, sources of carbon emissions. And we realized, I mean, we kind of started marching down that path because there was suddenly this expectation that the Clark Fork Coalition was going to be leading the way sure. on a climate change discussion. And we just realized at some point, you know, we actually don't have expertise in that area. What mm-hmm. are we doing? And even if we're just kind of facilitating conversation for experts to take over, is that a role? So we did have to reassess that. Um, but I think we were really sensitive to making sure that we put that sort of leadership position in someone else's hands that was competent. And we actually ended up helping support them for a little while Mm -hmm. um, until they could get their feet on the ground. So that was definitely a moment where we seemed to be starting to trot down a path that wasn't really tied. It wasn't wet enough. It needs to be wet. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So 
And I think that sort of speaks to some of the, the values of the organization as well. I mean, you say you, you sort of are drawn into this climate change arena. You know, you, you, the organization's been successful, so sort of looked to as a leader mm-hmm. on many dimensions in the community. I could see how others would want you to, you know, take that flag and run with it. Yeah. But being able to sort of find a home for that cause, mm-hmm. uh, I think, speaks to how a sort of you guys see the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. And along those lines, um, thinking about just some observations from the retreat and whatnot, I posed this question about, um, education and outreach, which I guess is part of the engage pillar. Mm -hmm. Um, how that lives in relationship to the restoration work, how the two are balanced. Are they, are they considered co-equal or complementary in some way? How, how does that, play out at your level and then how does it also sort of play out at the at the staff level yeah um it's very integrated and actually every year when we reflect on what worked and where we fell short as a staff it seems like every year we realize our engage our education outreach program works so much better when it really is tied in pretty tightly to some of our restoration projects Mm -hmm. and the science that we're learning and things we're discovering and i think the key is is because um, our education programming gets people out into the field. And we've right. learned that that's where lessons really stick. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can vouch for that myself. From, yeah, yeah, from the experiences I've been through with you folks, whether it's yeah. board orientation or the, the, the retreat up to the ranch, just seeing the work being done in the field, it yeah. just it illuminates so much more powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. So, for example, with our, we have a program called Hands on the Ranch, and that is designed, even though you'd never guess it from the title, that's designed to work with rural schools in the Upper Clark Fork to sure. help bring kind of the Superfund cleanup and the contamination issues to life. Mm-hmm. So we're out there um, with our restoration folks um, digging these soil pits and doing some soil profiling, and they take the soil samples back to labs and test them for arsenic and lead and zinc don't do that exercise without gloves yeah we, we think not <laughs> yeah we tell the children gloves on at right, all times right and you will not be licking and the kids fingers. are involved the kids are the kids are involved it. Yeah. yeah and they love it Absolutely. and it's in their own landscape and then they're also then interacting with some of our restoration team um and these kids then can then see these role models and wow mm-hmm. so with science i could end up doing work like this cool yeah, when does science, I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but when does science stop being, or when did it stop being fun? Like as a yeah. kid, it's fun. I watch my daughters, yeah. five and seven, come home. And they're just doing all kinds of fun science stuff. And yeah. it seems like we drift from that as, as well, maybe you don't because you, you work in it more than I do. But yeah. um, it just seems like we drift from that a little bit. And that's too yeah. bad. It gets too complicated. Yeah, it is too bad. And then it kind of opens the door to attacks on science and science gets dismissed right which we're seeing in the political arena right now but mm-hmm. yeah science is cool it it's is messy cool. you can make mistakes i mean you're supposed to make mistakes right you're supposed to disprove your hypothesis right where else are you told to go make some mistakes mm-hmm. well yeah education i guess that's true yeah we in try your to class in your marketing class i'm sure we try to encourage <laughs> that um learning from the mistakes as yeah. well so yeah um Anyway, so as we as we sort of move forward into the next phase, so you know, I'm not quite sure, uh, listeners, how much familiarity with the Clark Fork Coalition they have. You know, coming off of you know the, I don't know, uh, this is a bad pun, but the sort of watershed moment for the organization <laughs> was the Milltown Dam removal. Mm-hmm. What year does that? What was the start of that um, actual removal and then the completion? Mm-hmm. What was that? So the. Actual on the ground work started in 2007. Okay. October 2nd, 2007. Okay. And then that the, was the first kind of swing. That up. was the first bucket of um, a scoop of a backhoe just started removing contamination. The dam wasn't breached until March of 2008. So okay. we've got a 10 year anniversary coming up. Yeah. March 28th, 2018. Absolutely. And then um, it still took another uh, two slash three years for complete removal of the dam, um, removal of the contamination, and then the re-channelization and restoration. Sure. And then nature took over. 
And that became, you know, I wasn't living here at the time, yeah. but my understanding was that just engaged the entire community. It was yeah. this giant, very visible issue. Mm-hmm. And membership at the Clark Fork Coalition was at its all-time high. Yeah. And since then, membership has declined, although that's not to say the organization has declined, but just the right. membership metric has. And then you sometimes get these questions, what's the next big thing for mm-hmm. the organization? And so as committed to the mission as you are, how do you, one, how do you sort of view that question? Mm-hmm. And you know, do, do you sort of agree with the premise of it? And if you don't, what should what question should we be asking? Yeah. And then if you do, sort of what are what are these next big things that you're you're thinking of? Yeah. I that was like a four part yeah. question in three parts. Sorry about that. Okay, well I'll take a dive in. If I miss something, let me know. But <laughs> I love I love questions like that. I just just think it forces you to think really strategically. And I mean, communities like to be inspired about mm-hmm. big campaigns, and there was nothing like that dam removal to get people excited. I mean, it was pie in the sky. Dam removal I mean, even to this day, dam removal is a little bit radical. Yeah, Back then, absolutely. it was incredibly radical. It was the stuff of Hey Duke Lives in um, the Monkey Wrench Gang. Mm-hmm. But we were able to paint this vision of what could be at that confluence and also talk about, you know, it's a toxic cesspool at that yeah. Milltown Reservoir. It's a drag on our community. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I, I mean, yeah, what a slam dunk. So it was a pretty amazing and dazzling victory, and I know that we'll we'll always be associated with that to some extent with then people expecting. I mean, you set an expectation. Sure. That, wow, if you got that done, okay, what next? What can't you do? Well, we go back to the question of what does the watershed need from us? What does Mm -hmm. it need most? And so I think then it becomes incumbent upon us to get really clear about what the watershed needs from us and why and communicate that to our constituents. Our constituent base is really mostly in Missoula, although we do have members supporting our work in 37 other states Mm -hmm. in the U.S., but it's mostly Missoula. That's our strongest base. So, you know, people in Missoula tend to look at the river and it looks like it's in great shape. It's clean and it's flowing. Even at the end of summer, there's at least some flows there. Mm -hmm. It's just not the case in the upper river. It's not the case in our headwater streams. So, it's a challenge for us then to get people to lift their sights and look a little farther upstream on what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to do that with flow because we've got um, climate change accelerating impacts. So we're seeing really different hydrological regimes happening. Runoff happens earlier. Temperatures skyrocket sure. earlier. Um, we don't see the precipitation that we historically have seen. The temperatures stay hot later. So, I mean, we're really going to be facing some big stressors in the years to come from climate change, especially in the summer. So we've got to be more clever with how we manage our water and work together to do that. And, I mean, even people living in Missoula who are not irrigators need to care about this Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's just plumbing in some ways. There's some pretty easy fixes. But, um... It's also about social aspects and social coordination and working together and having some pretty frank conversations about when we time use of water and sure. how it's used. So anyway, we really need Missoula involved in that, and it's on us to communicate that. We also have this threat of invasive mussels. I think maybe in Missoula people are increasingly mm-hmm. aware of it, but everybody has a role to play with that, so we need to get people alert to some of those threats and how they can help. I mean, especially those who use the rivers for recreation. Yeah. Clean, drain, and dry Mm -hmm. is the mantra. So we've got some education to do on that front. And then cleanup of um, lingering contamination sites. You've still got a lot of pollution in the upper Clark Fork from the century of mining and smelting. We've got a lot of pollution out at Smurfett Stone. Um, ambitious cleanups don't happen without intense public demand for it to happen. Right, right. So we've got to get our base excited about some of these challenges ahead. And probably those things I just ticked off are nowhere near as sexy as getting a dam out of a river. But gosh, they're so important. So yeah. marketing and communication yeah, is going to be key going and forward. Storytelling and yeah. trying to craft a, a message that makes sense and gets people yeah. excited. I mean, that's that's a big part yeah. of it. And that's yep. um, 
maybe that's the next big thing is sort of mm-hmm. figuring out those narratives mm-hmm. and bringing the people in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Karen, this was fantastic. Uh, super organization. Always love learning more about how it operates. And I think listeners will, will be really inspired by how mission driven and focused uh, you are in your leadership of this, this important organization. So as we close here, how can people learn more about the Clark Fork Coalition? There are all kinds of ways people can learn more about the Clark Fork Coalition, starting with our website, www.clarkfork.org. We have phone numbers also listed on that website and our physical address, and we are certainly available. Doors are open nine to five every day, so if you want to pop in and introduce yourself, that's great. If you have a specific question you want to ask, you can go ahead and send us an email, info at clarkfork.org. And coming up this weekend is a really important event for the coalition, right? Big event for the Clark Fork Coalition. It's our annual river cleanup. Mm -hmm which we've been doing for 15 years at this point. And it's a great time for the community to come together and give a little back, give a little back to a river that really defines our identity and um, helps us be a good community. So great. people are going to come out, clean up trash along 15 river miles. We have buses that'll shuttle people out to some of the hot spots that are in farther flung places. Um, pre low tech basically show up wearing long slacks, jeans, bring some work gloves, though we'll have some extras if you forget, sunscreen and a raincoat because this is Montana. Yeah, you, you never, never know, know in April. You never know. Could be anything. Um, so it's from 930. Registration is 930 to 10 at the park. We'll have some coffee to get people heated up, get you caffeinated. We'll have a little safety talk, a welcome by the mayor, and then off you go to clean up with friends and family for two hours. Then you come back to the park, to Karis Park, and we put on a really nice barbecue spread and everybody can enjoy the sense of community around the river. Super awesome event, important event. I encourage all listeners to check it out. And again, Karen, always a pleasure. I look forward to more conversations like this. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you, Justin. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Karen as much as I enjoyed having it. She's always an inspiration. Next week, we have Christopher Preston. Christopher is a philosophy professor here at the University of Montana, and he recently published a book called The Synthetic Age. Fascinating, scary, terrifying book, uh, but also uplifting in many ways, too. So we get into the book and uh, much of the work that went into it. Stay tuned. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. Remember that A New Angle was brought to you by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. They're our first sponsor, and we can't thank them enough. CED is one of the largest electrical wholesale supply companies in the country with nearly 600 locations nationwide. CED is a privately owned business-to-business company that distributes just about every piece of equipment you need to keep your lights on, your energy flowing, and your lifestyle comfortable. CED is also an important employer in our community, and they have a keen interest in University of Montana graduates. To explore career opportunities, check out www.cedcareers.com. Moving forward, if you have any suggestions for guests, cool people doing awesome things, please let us know. And if you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. First, rate us on iTunes. Ratings help others find the show. Second, write a review. The more reviews we get, and hopefully positive ones, the more we can grow. And third, please just tell your friends about it. In addition, you can also support A New Angle financially. For information on sponsorship opportunities, please visit our website, www.business.umt.edu slash a new angle. There you will also find a link to support the pod. Before we go, I'd like to thank a few folks for making this project happen. First, my colleagues at the College of Business for supporting this endeavor. In particular, Professor Josh Herbold for writing and recording original music for the show. We also have music provided by Switchback Records, a student-run record label here at the college. I'd also like to thank Elizabeth Willey, recent UM graduate Michelle DeFluke, and the entire comms team here at the College of Business. And finally, thanks to my producer, Stefan Borson. As we close, if you have any suggestions, comments, questions, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word, and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.